Cool, all right. Thanks, David. Um, so my presentation is similar to David's in the sense I'm looking at the crowdfunding market, but I'm looking at the supply side. So I'm thinking about how does a crowdfunding company actually think about incentivizing and organizing fundraisers and the funders within those fundraisers, okay? So a lot of research that's been done that's spy funded, that's pre-spy funded has focused on the demand side, which is like, what do donors want? How do you attract successful donors? How do you attract donors to give more? So in economics, what we call the extensive margin and the intensive margin, okay? So there's a lot of research on that area, but very little on what do employees who work within the charitable sector want? How do they get paid? Uh, how do you attract more productive employees? And how do you get more, uh, your employees to be more productive? Okay, so this is like an area of economics that's starting to become quite interesting. And I'll talk about a bit more about what's happening at, uh, at SPY uh, in this conference in this area. But I'm going to focus particularly on how do you get your employees or your fundraisers to be more effective? Okay, I'm going to do that in the context of uh, a crowdfunding website. So my, my main question is, or m main aim is, can you actually think about changing the efficacy or the efficiency of fundraisers? And I'm gonna do it in two ways. One is using financial incentives, the classic bread and butter for economists. I also use behavioral incentives as well. And I'll talk a bit more about what those are. Uh, I use a natural field experiment, so it's a randomized control trial with fundraisers where they don't know they're part of an experiment, where we randomize different level of financial incentives across them on a crowdfunding platform. And what we find, just to give you an upshot, uh, a teaser is like financial incentives really do matter in terms of how much money a fundraiser brings in, but it depends on how you frame those incentives, okay? And given what John said this morning, there's a lot of heterogeneity in our data and our results, okay? So, in some of the academic literature, there's like two great papers um, by Irigunese and, and, and John List and Craig Landry and others, and some others are in the room today, where thinking about how do you incentivize door-to-door -door canvases to actually be more productive and generate more money from donors, okay? So both of those studies use a um, conditional and unconditional gift, essentially, and to understand whether by giving a gift to an employee, you make them more effective, uh, uh, productive. And that's what they find, okay? So in the Gnesian List paper, it was uh, people, volunteers coming in to canvas money uh, from individuals. Rather than getting $10 an hour, they were given $20 an hour. So $10 more than expected, it led to an increase in donors, uh, donor rates and, and money. And then there's a session tomorrow all on this supply side issue that you can go to. If you look at all of like the, like go on Amazon and all the fundraising books about how to be a successful uh, charity, how to be a successful fundraiser, very rarely do they mention the supply side. Like how do you organize your charity in terms of how you pay your workers? How do you structure them to actually become an effective charity? Okay? So very little across all of the bestsellers in terms of that. So I'm going to focus on crowdfunding. And crowdfunding started in 2001 with an, with an artist in Boston who wanted to actually generate more money for his music company. And since then, there's been fundraisers, uh, so crowdsource uh, funders for charity, there's been crowdsourcing for uh, products, crowdsourcing for peer-to-peer -peer lending. So it's a big market. Right now in the US, it's about a $6 billion industry, okay, across rewards-based, debt-based, and charity-based. And the World Bank uh, last year came up with a report suggesting that by 2025, the market could be as large as $100, $100 billion per year. Okay, so that's, that's a large market. Okay, so we should, as economists, as researchers, and as practitioners, we should be interested in this market. It's a new market that's come along. Whether it's taking money from other parts of the charitable sector or new money, I'm not making a statement on that. All I'm suggesting is thinking about how do we think about making these crowdfunding platforms more successful. So I work and partnered with Give Forward. Uh, they are a crowdfunder based in Chicago. And um, convenient for me, they, they are located 100 meters from where I live. So for me doing an experiment, it's really easy. Uh, <laughs> because the transaction costs are quite low. 
And it's a great website, like really nice UX design, really like nice to interact with. And they have about 2.5 million people visiting their website every month. Uh, they have about 6,000 new fundraisers every month. And what they do to make money, they're, they're a for-profit company. They take about 7.9% of the total amount that you raise for themselves, and they charge about 50 cents per transaction. Okay? So this is what they do. Uh, they help you to set up a fundraiser. Uh, if you want to actually get some money for a cause for yourself or for someone else, they help you in every part, every step of the process. Okay? So they help you create a page. They, and it's all online. Um, so through Facebook and through Gmail or through email, they help you with. They have trainers and they have coaches to help you think about what are the best strategies to actually get the demand side to actually give. And then they also have a community fund, which is what a lot of uh, crowdsourcing websites have, which is how can we actually think about using incentives to actually increase the e efficacy of these fundraisers? So that's essentially, and, and I think um, like Kickstarter uses it sometimes, uh, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, the whole lot of similar sort of incentives, okay? So how do fundraisers find Give Forward? Well, they find about 75% comes through search engines, and about 45% comes from the ads, Google Ads, okay? So these are individuals that want to actually raise money for a cause, and they're using Google or they're using search engines to get there. Okay, so that's how we get the fundraisers. I'm not looking at selection of the fundraisers. But when you actually go on to give forwards, they help you create a page. Uh, it looks quite sleek, uh, sleek and, and quite nice to the eye. So this is an example, it's very similar to what David suggested. You have the picture, you have the title, you have the description, then you've got the big give now button, you've got the share, uh, and you've got a team, so you can create a team. So you can actually create a different like, organization for the fundraiser. And then you have a target. But unlike with David's, there's no time limit. You just, that's your target. And whatever money that you raise, give forward will take 7.9% of that, and you keep the rest, irrespective of how much you, earn, how much you raise, okay? So that's the, that's the uh, context. And this is how most of the money comes in. It's by sharing posts on Facebook, okay? So 60% of their revenue, and it's similar to other charity-based crowdfunders, uh, they help you in essentially post this to your friends on Facebook, okay? And Give Forward have raised about $185 million uh, to date, and 60% of that comes from Facebook, okay? Just from Facebook posts, okay? And they help you post. And then about 20% of the money comes from uh, email sharing, so they can actually work out who's been shared the email to the, the link to that uh, crowdfunding website, and about 20%, they just don't know where it comes from, okay? There's, n there's no path that they could look at. So about 80% comes from some sort of online sharing of information, okay? So what we, what we, the experiment that we did was trying to understand whether we could actually incentivize fundraisers to raise more money and therefore, it'll raise more money in a cost-effective way, so give forward will also make more money. Okay? So we had 259 fundraisers that in between two and eight days of starting a fundraiser, they had raised between $1,000 and $6,500 or $6,000. Okay? So we have over half a million dollars uh, raised. And what we did, we allocated about $33,000 worth of incentives across these 259 fundraisers, okay, uh, literally two months ago. And uh, apologies for not doing a lot of data analysis. I got the data back on Monday. Um, so this is what the experiment was, essentially. Okay, so we had five different groups. We had a control group where we didn't touch them. Nothing was business as usual, okay, for those fundraisers. The second group was we give them an incentive to actually hit the target, okay? So we said, hey, we will give you, for example, $100 if you raise $1,000 in seven days' time, okay? And we framed that as a gain, okay? So that's, you will gain that if you do that, 
You get x if you do y. Okay? We have a loss frame, which is uh, in economics, that comes from prospect theory, which is losses loom larger than gains. So people don't like losses. Uh, it's weighed twice as much as gains on average from a lot of lab experiments. There's more field experiments that show in that losses matter. So what we did is said, oh, we have earmarked and given you $100 to your fund. If you don't raise $1,000 in seven days, we'll take it away from you. Okay? So the framing is different. The incentives are exactly the same, but the framing is different. And then we had a higher incentive and uh, both in the gain and the loss frame. Okay? So what we're comparing is low incentives versus high incentives. So rather than $100, it's actually $150. So it's not a lot higher, but we're looking at what is the marginal impact of, a, of more money given to the fundraiser. And then we're comparing gain frame versus loss frame, okay? Across 259 fundraisers. The sample was a little bit uh, segmented. So what we did, we created just three separate samples. So those who raised about 1,000 to 2,500, we randomized them into either receiving $100 or $150 for a target of 1,000. We randomized the loss and gain across those who received that. We split it then for sample B, which is slightly more. This is when the experiment started. They had raised about two and a half to three and a half thousand dollars. Their incentive was higher, but their target was also higher. And then for sample C, these are the ones who have done really well after two, two to five days. Uh, they raised between three and a half thousand and six thousand uh, dollars. We give them a higher incentive, but obviously a higher target. And this is where Gear Forward would earn uh, a lot more money than the other two. Okay, so they would actually. Uh, be good for the fundraiser and, and good for give forward. This is the example of the email. This is the treatment. We sent out emails. One email, randomized across the 259 fundraisers, and just saying we have 30 chosen you to take part uh, and give you a re reward for your good work. And we said if you raise $1,000, we'll give you an additional $100 to your account. Uh, and that's essentially what the email was like. Very simple email given out. The loss frame, identical apart from the fact that we said uh, we've en already enrolled you to receive the additional $100. If you are unable to raise $1,000, we'll remove the $100 from your fundraiser. Um, so everything's the same apart from saying you will lose it essentially. We've removed that $100 from your account that we've earmarked towards you. Okay? So what does the data look like? So before the experiment started, the average fundraiser raised about just, just over $2,000, okay, that was the average. So after the experiment started, we looked at this for two months after, we found that the control group raised just about 2,000 more, okay, right? So they kind of like doubled um, the, the amount of money that they raised after the experiment started. What happened for the, the, the low incentive in the gain? It actually reduced the amount of money raised in the gain frame, so giving them Either $100 or $200, sorry, or $150 or 250 or 200 sorry, didn't actually lead to more productive fundraising. When we had the higher incentive, it actually backfired even more. Okay, so the extra $50 led to a decrease, uh, and that's significantly different from the control in this sample. But the losses work particularly well. So when you told the funders we'll take that money away from you for the low incentive, actually led to um, about seven, uh, $700 extra for each fundraiser in that treatment group. For the higher incentive, similar effect here. So actually that marginal increase of the $50 actually led to a decrease in fund, fundraising, okay? So this is like the overall picture. Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So this is the sample A and sample B. So these are the ones who had accrued or raised less than three and a half thousand dollars, okay? Very similar story. Losses work particularly well. Gains don't really work, okay? But we can't really distinguish that from zero. But the, the group that actually had some interesting results were those who've already uh, raised more than three and a half thousand. We thought we would actually uh, give forward, thought that they would actually make a lot of money from these guys. What happened? it all backfired for those, okay? So those who actually raised the most early on actually led to more than in the loss frame, $2,500 in comparison to the control group. 
Okay? I think it's a really cool finding. I need to work out more exactly what's going on here. And then we looked at the behavioral versus the financial incentives. Okay? So if we compare gains versus loss, so for the, for the charity or for the, the profit for the company here, there's no changes in the cost for them. It's just changing the framing. And that led to more than $750 extra of money raised for the fundraiser. Um, and obviously, that's good for Give Forward. When we look at the incentives, the financial incentives, low versus high, we see that actually giving them a larger incentive actually didn't have any additional benefit and actually led to a decrease of about, uh, about, six, about $550. Okay? So it's really quite important in thinking about why, why it's going on. And this could be one of the reasons. So when you start a fundraiser, you can start it by yourself or you can create a team. Okay, so they can help you create a team where every person in that team can go online and help to spread the word. Okay, so what we find is like, so the, the blue bars are the soloists, those who are raising money by themselves and they're not part of a team. Okay, what we find is like when we actually interfere with them and give them incentives, it doesn't particularly work. Okay, it actually backfires a little bit, especially for the gain frame. But for the team, and that team can be from two people up to 18 uh, in my sample. Uh, actually, the incentives when they frame a loss are significantly higher uh, fundraising potential than those in the control group. Okay? So this is, where we, this is where now we can start to think about targeting the interventions. Okay? And think about heterogeneity from a practitioner point of view. Yeah, go ahead. Just for the whole fundraiser as a whole. So each individual on the team knew that that hundred dollars would apply to their Not necessarily. So that email was just sent to the main the creator of the page essentially. Um, but what we can do and what I'll look at is exactly whether it increased like Facebook shares essentially. So is it the the the, the creator that was changing their behavior or was it the whole team? There could be just like differences between soloists and, and teams that I can't observe, just like unobserved differences that the experiment is not picking up on. Yeah, go ahead. They could be anybody that you choose. So it could be your brother, it could be your sister, it could be someone else that's gonna help you raise money for that cause that you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, so normally um, for Give Forward, it's, uh, uh, it, it's uh, normally health-related. So more than, more than half are health-related fundraisers. Um, so it, it could be your kid, it could be your auntie, it could be your grandmother. They've incurred some sort of disease or some sort of healthcare cost. Please help me raise money to overcome that. Yeah. Would you? So if you pick the, uh, the amount of Say again? So these are not all people that are raising exactly two thousand dollars. These are so the amount they're raising are all exchanges. Yeah. So yeah. what happens when you control for that? Relative so two thousand relative to what is the top there? Yeah, yeah, what exactly. Yeah. So that, that's what we look at next is like if the incentive target was more than right. your target, it backfires even more. Like the effects get a lot worse. So if you have an incentive you want to use it on those who are miles away from the target rather than those who are close to the target. And you might be attacked by a wasp. Uh, as with David's example, you might think, but well, anyway, do donors are going to, if you've got a target, the closer you get, you're going to get better donors in anyway. So given an incentive, I don't know why in this case backfires, but it's particularly bad the closer you get to the target. Go ahead. Uh, you mean when, when it's when? So you think is the extra hundred dollars put onto the account when? when yeah, so I'm trying to. It, the, the money is not given to the fundraiser; it's given to the cause the fundraiser is supporting. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's so, not. It's not a private incentive. So this is all. Uh, the, the donation total include two things: one, the amount of the incentive given, and two, donations by the fundraiser themselves or the charity. 
Yeah, so um, the grand total, the amount of money that could raise would include both of those two things. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Um, when we look at the type of social good that the money has been raised for, we don't find any differences. Health versus non-health, there's no differences in the results. Um, if you look at different types of health, it doesn't really matter, but I've only got 259 data points, so I can't really chop up the data that much. But what we do next is now I have every Facebook share from all these 259 fundraisers. I know exactly for each share, how many people clicked, clicked on the link, looked at the Facebook share, I also have the emails that were sent out as well. So I can start to look at, because um, obviously I haven't looked at whether you get more donors in or less donors in, or whether you change the share of the, the contribution to the fundraiser. I haven't looked at that yet. But I want to look at effort. Like what are these incentives doing to effort? Are they actually crowding it out or crowding it in? And who are they actually sharing the post to on Facebook? And that's something that I could look at. Um, David, go ahead. Um, probably not, but this is going to be one experiment of many with give forwards. I think trying to understand the beliefs of people when they receive these type of extra incentives, uh, that's something I definitely want to focus on next for sure. So, what we usually look at is now you're looking at total fundraise, amount fundraised, it would be either median, average, or like the highest there. Because it might be a reference. Yeah, so but given that 60%, so say if we assume 60% comes from Facebook, it's just a share that I'm putting on Facebook that will go on your profile page. So there'd be no like ask on it because give forward controls what's on that share. So I don't think they change the ask. They might change the frequency of the ask, like how many times they post on Facebook, but they won't change the, the actual content in the ask. Oh, you can tell your friends, yeah. Yeah. So it might be, it might be yeah, it could be, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, the summary like, yeah, conditional financial incentives might work for fundraisers um, if you actually put it in the loss frame rather than the gain frame. The mechanisms as to why, I don't know yet, and that was like the, the, the questions coming out, which I hope to work on soon. Um, but generally, crowdfunding is going to increase uh, whether you like it or not. And it's going to be a market that's going to be really strong in the future. So try and understand who uses, who uses crowdfunding, what donors use crowdfunding, and how you can actually set up fundraisers in a way that's efficient for both sides of the market is, it's gonna be a big area in economics. I know that a lot of people are working with crowdfunding websites because you can do experiments really easily. Uh, they have programmers who can do A, B, C, D, E testing quite quickly. As David has uh, demonstrated that there's a lot of data coming out there. You can actually work out some of the mechanisms. So, uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you for attending this session. And um, yeah, go and enjoy your coffee. Thank you all. Thank you.